Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Khalil Svandiyari. I run the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. Uh, I would like to welcome you today to our meeting with the Iran project to launch their latest publication, Iran and its neighbors, regional implications for US policy of a nuclear agreement. You will be receiving a copy of the publication as you leave the room. Um, in the past, we have hosted two uh, publication launches with the Iran project, uh, one in April 2013 and the other one in September 2012. And this is the Middle East uh, program for your information, 193rd meeting on Iran since 1998. And I must say that we started our uh, the Middle East program and the Iran project with a very small grant from the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, whose president is here. And I always say, if it wasn't for that grant, we wouldn't be able to launch the Iran project. So once again, thank you, uh, Steve. Today's meeting coincides with the presence of Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif, who is in the US and already gave his first interview to NPR. And also Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, who will be here next week. Of course, all eyes are going to be on both President Rouhani and Foreign Minister Zarif, who will explain Iran's foreign policy uh, and uh, of major interest will be the future of the nuclear negotiations and uh, Iran's role in the region and its relations with its neighbors, the topic of the book launch and today's discussion. Um, we really couldn't have chosen a better time to convene this meeting with such a group of eminent speakers. Uh, we will, once this room fills in, we will have an overflow. And I would like to ask Ambassador uh, Pickering to also take the questions from the overflow. Uh, I now invite um, Ambassador William Wurst to come to the podium and introduce the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm always amused at the fact that Holly has to stand up here and, and tell, her, tell us who she is. If there's anybody who's been involved with the Middle East or Iran for uh, the last 10, 20 years, they know she's our guided light and uh, marvelous colleague. And, and I worked here for a while, and she, she was a great friend. Um, thank you for doing this again, Holly. And thank Jane for supporting this. Um, I also wanted to say publicly that how sad I am that we've lost Michael Adler, who was a friend of all of many of you and certainly of mine, and, and who was a dogged and, and, and well-informed uh, writer on, on this Iran relationship. I um, want to thank the authors. There were 10 authors we had writing the essays, and for their patience in understanding that we were reshaping their essays to fit into this booklet which I think um, was not easy for some of them. Uh, but <laughs> here we are. We have uh, what we think is a homoge homogeneous effort to describe the situation. Um, I also want to thank the endorsers. We have 31. Uh, many of them are, are people who've endorsed all of our reports before, and um, including Brandt and, and Zbig and, and uh, Senator Lugar and, and many others who, who share not every word that we think, but share in general of the mission we feel we're on. Um, the core group I've, of people I had to deal with during this six months period of writing, uh, I like to just describe Tom, I consider to, I, I would just characterize him as heft and stature. Mm -hmm. Frank as knowledge and elegant formulation. Jim is precision in language and data. Jim Walsh, who's not here, unfortunately. Paul is subtlety and intelligence. And of course, there's Stephen, who 
is my partner, uh, always contributing ideas and uh, an overview of how we should be doing what we're doing. And Stephen and I, who was at the Brock Riddle Brothers Fund, um, began this in 2002. And most of the group has been together for that time. And we've remained together. We still talk to each other. I want you to know that. And I guess I would characterize myself as somewhere between the driver and the spaniel in this whole <laughs> discussion. Um, Plowshares, I want to thank. Uh, Plowshares has been a tremendous partner of ours here in, in Washington and, and uh, supporter of what we do. And Joe Sirensoni has been outstanding. Um, Iris, where's Iris? Iris Bieri, um is theoretically my deputy director, but um, there's more to Iris than that. And uh, she's a star, and you'll hear more of her over the next decade and more. She's really been a spirit behind all of us, and, and I, I'm pleased. Congratulations, Iris, on your good work. We have Richard Cohen, who was our editor. Um, out of touch occasionally, but uh, pro profoundly right on some of the uh, key editorial questions. Jim Hogue helped us edit some of the papers. A, a, about, a little bit about the Iran project. <clears throat> we, we began, as I say, in 2002. Uh, Stephen and I had the bright idea when I was at president of the United Nations Association that we should begin this process, and we began it with, with Javad Zarif. Um, and it went on for uh, all these years, we've had various incarnations of what we've been doing. For a while, it was back channel, uh, track two work. Then it's been much more public over the last uh, several years for many reasons. Um, and our goal is, is to try to be as objective as we can about this. We favor um, a diplomacy over other options. Uh, we're not uh, afraid to say, as we did in our first report launched here, that if necessary, military force may well be necessary. Um, we're absolutely committed to the belief that uh, a nuclear agreement is an essential factor in anything we do moving forward with Iran. And although it would be difficult, we see that it's going to be, um, it's hard to imagine the alternatives to getting this agreement. Um, the report, um, many of you, let me show you a copy of it. Um, Many of you will find getting through the report difficult, maybe getting through the summary a little less difficult. I just hope you're able to read the entire title. Um, <laughs> you're going to be asked after this to repeat the name, the title of this publication, and you'll all fail, I assure. I, I can't remember what it is. But um, it is a, a, a document which we think is, is um, embodies much of what we've done <coughs> the best of. It's, we think it's objective. We do take positions that we haven't done before. We have been speculative because it's about the future. And the core issue of this report is we have all felt that um, there needs to be a strategy for U.S. policy in the region. And that strategy has to involve many countries. Um, and the strategy we've outlined is a strategy after the agreement uh, is signed, after we reach a nuclear agreement. And the whole postulation in the document is that this is what could happen, what the options are open to the United States for developing, for the first time really, a coherent strategy on dealing with the region. And Iran is part of that strategy. And the second thing it has to achieve after the signing of the agreement is that Iran has to agree to do what we say they're going to do. And uh, those are two big questions. But having said that, I'll introduce you to Tom Pickering, who's been our heft in this whole operation, and, uh, and he'll carry the rest of the day. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Bill, very much. And just let me repeat our thanks to Jane and to Hala uh, at the Woodrow Wilson Center in this important, indeed significant for us, relationship <clears throat> we have birthed three children here. Uh, the third is on the way, uh, and it's been very important to us. Secondly, uh, let me make sure you all know that despite an affliction of excessive humility, Bill Lewis makes this thing work, uh, that everything that we do, that the inspiration for 
our memoranda that uh, this being the fourth today and indeed much of what we write and think is inspired by Bill, driven by Bill, written by Bill, whatever you want to say. And Bill is the major author of this report. Make, uh, make uh, uh, no denigration of that at all. The rest of us were allowed to nitpick in small corners. Uh, but Bill had the inspiration and indeed helped to put it all together. We had differences in this report, uh, and we worked them out, I think, in a reasonable way. Uh, I will say a few words about the report. I'll be followed by Frank, who's sitting over on the end, uh, because Frank has an air ticket that he has to honor. Uh, and that Frank, as you all know, is Mr. Middle East and has been around it for a long period of time, served uh, in, in an illustrious way as ambassador to Egypt, uh, also served in India in an equally illustrious way. Uh, Frank has paid a lot of attention to Syria and will talk to us about Syria and how and in what way uh, success on an, Af on an Iranian nuclear agreement would make a difference there. I'll then turn to Paul Piller. Paul has 23 years at the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, is a magnificent observer, scholar, and analyst of the Middle East. And in every sense, if somebody had, I think, a particularly good addendum to Bill's magnificent writing, it was Paul's deep sense of how do you use Occam's razor <laughs> to cut to the quick and get things said in the most succinct, most clear, and most analytical form. Uh, and Paul will talk about uh, IS, IS. Uh, we had a deep argument about what to call it, but that's what I'm told I have to call it. And um, uh, Iraq and how that interrelationship, which is fundamentally very important, will work. Um, Dr. Barney Rubin, New York University, is I think by everybody's lights, the U.S., maybe world's expert, on Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan, the other neighbor of I Iran on which we will focus today, is an extremely important issue in its own right and how and in what way we in the United States and Iran play out as our forces leave in that very important issue are extremely significant. Um, I will say only the following few things about the report. The report was put together to look ahead. Uh, the report is based on what might happen if we're successful in getting an agreement. It also addresses in short compass what might happen if we don't get an agreement. Um, but the fundamental purpose was to look at the regional possibilities. None of us believed that we should change our policy or our posture in terms of what we wish to see in an Iran nuclear agreement as a result of a preoccupation with regional issues. And I think that's important to keep in mind because it's a fundamental underlayment uh, for uh, the report. Uh, and there are many who would be confused or might attack us or wish to be confused about the report in that regard. Uh, the report itself uh, takes into account uh, lots of the very difficult hard to analyze, sometimes mysterious issues and problems in the region. But if you're looking for a good primer about the region in a reasonable, in a reasonable compass, the, the report was not designed to do that, but it does it. Uh, the report covers uh, the Gulf states, and we make a very clear statement that our policy with the Gulf states needs to be put on the track of closer and firmer relations and we need to keep in mind their deep concerns about Iran across the Gulf from them and how and in what way we can help uh, as seemingly it might be possible for Iran to begin to play a larger role in the region that they are not minimized, uh, uh, outcast, or otherwise eliminated from consideration and that they are part, if I can put it this way, of our natural security preoccupation. The same in particular with Saudi Arabia, which is treated uh, to a separate review. On the other side of the Middle East ledger, we spent a lot of time, uh, did a lot of serious examination, uh, ironed out a, a lot of messy creases on how and in what way Israel should be associated in this particular set of activities, both with respect to the nuclear agreement and what follows. It goes without saying that this is of primordial importance to Israel. It is in a region 
uh, where, in fact, it remains on the outer fringes. Uh, an agreement would do two things. It would certainly improve the prospects for tranquility and the lack of nuclear weapons and their potential use in the region, and certainly Israel is preeminently preoccupied with that. And we suggest policies to move it ahead. Uh, we suggest that the United States make completely clear to Israel that while the agreement is in force and being observed, it would be the most serious of all mistakes to use military force against Iran. But that's a sample of some of the efforts we have made to speak, if I could put it this way, truth to reality on this particular issue. Uh, we examined energy relationships. We examined Turkey. Turkey has a potentially very important connective and interrelationship role with Iran in the region, and indeed is and will be uh, one of the major players in the region, even if the U.S. State Department uh, still likes to continue to treat it uh, as non-Middle Eastern in its organizational arrangements. Uh, Turkey, in many ways, has a very serious and, and important relationship with Iran. Neither all good nor all bad, but it's significant. We've looked at energy. We've looked at U.S. military forces. A word about both. Uh, energy is of growing significance. Certainly, Russia's uh, actions in Ukraine and the strategic dependence of Russia on its ability to export hydrocarbons, particularly to Europe, means that one of the fundamental ways that equation might be reversed uh, is, in fact, to uh, pluralize European dependence on hydrocarbons. And here, an agreement with Iran would make a significant contribution to that effort, as indeed would uh, further stability in the Iraqi oil patch, if I can say that, because Iraq, too, over the recent years, has increased its oil production and potential for export. I think that that, finally, with the U.S. military, is that we need to shape our military to meet the exigencies of the, circ of the situation. They have to be there, if there is a nuclear agreement, uh, to help in whatever way they can be useful to assure that that agreement is continued to be observed. Uh, they need to be there to meet contingencies. Uh, the emergence on the scene of ISIS is in itself one of those contingencies in the president's policy statements uh, over the last uh, seven days have made that very, very important. Final, final point. Uh, Hollis said we could have not picked a better time. You're entirely right. But if I had to say, even the wisdom of Bill Lures was not sufficient to allow us to understand all of the circumstances that would come together. But Bill is as close as anybody to being able to do that. In every sense of the word, we feel uh, we've come on the scene at a very good time, that we hope we will make a contribution to your thinking uh, and indeed to your ideas and thoughts to one of the most complex problems in one of the most complex regions. I've already now overextended my time. Bill is looking daggers at me, so I'm turning to Frank Wisner. Tom <clears throat> and Bill, thank you for your very generous introductions of me. How I wanted to express my particular appreciation to you, Mike, the center, and please convey all of our good wishes to Jane. Uh, <clears throat> in the introductions that have been delivered so far, uh, there's one key player who hasn't been recognized. Um, this player uh, is the power and strength that made Bill Lures what he was as he put this, <laughs> put this effort together. Absolutely. Made it possible for Bill, you, to recover from an extraordinary illness, <clears throat> regain strength, and to see this project through in a manner that I could never have imagined. So, Wendy, let me say to you from all of us as well, God bless you, really. You're part of this effort just as much as any one of us are. <clears throat> We're all glad you're here today. Um, <clears throat> I, in particular, because the subject is so important, we're talking about strategy, strategy for the United States in a particularly uh, vexed region where we have major national interests, strategy that would flow from the logic of a nuclear agreement, not without a nuclear agreement, but from the logic of a nuclear agreement. It falls to me to talk 
about one aspect of that strategy, I would argue an important one. The question is Syria. Uh, the President the other day <clears throat> laid out the outlines of an American approach towards the crisis in Syria <clears throat> and Iraq, the crisis brought to us by ISIS. Um, he made it very clear at the time that we needed a political structure in which to engage ISIS and to defeat it. Uh, he addressed that notably in the context of, of Iraq, where the president pointed out the importance of an inclusive government that would revitalize the Iraqi army. I'd like to argue with all of you today that the same inclusive structure is needed for Syria. You can't defeat ISIS without Iraq. You can't defeat it without Syria. It's as <clears throat> important one to the other to the overall success of the latest portion of the venture we're, we're launched in. But then there's also the Syrian civil war that has plagued us now for better than four years and threatens to disrupt <clears throat> our most important interests in the region, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, shaking even Turkey as a near neighbor. Um, the Syrian civil war requires a settlement too, and all of us recognize that settlement cannot come about as a result of, a military, of military action. It has to be conceived politically. At the heart of what's going to happen in the future in Syria must lie Iran. And so as we begin to think beyond the logic of the nuclear agreement, our, my eyes settle on Syria as a field of potential collaboration between the United States and Iran. Explicit, implicit, but absolutely necessary. Why? Because Iran has declared now for a number of years vital national interests of its own in the Syrian equation. Iran today is the principal supporter of the regime in Syria. Its military effort, its economic support, uh, its political support. Iranian <coughs> cadre have infiltrated, been brought into virtually every level of Syria's government, security, military forces. Iran plays a huge, huge role. And Syria's dependence on Iran, on Russia, is vital. But Iran is absolutely central. Why do I uh, point to Syria? Iran and the United States because I believe Iran's positions on Syria are not frozen. Iran <clears throat> wants to preserve access to Syria and the influence that its relationship with Syria has given it. In order to have that access, it's my <coughs> personal view that the Iranians are not wedded in the outcome, it's different than the beginning, to the continuation of the Ba'ath regime and Bashar al-Assad as we know it today. But they need to have certainty about where they're headed. We too need certainty. We need ability to mobilize Syria's capabilities in order to deal with the crisis of ISIS. And that brings us back to a political settlement. How is that going to occur? It's not going to occur easily. It's obviously extraordinarily complicated. Two failed attempts in Geneva remind us how utterly difficult it is to get a secured, a, to secure a political settlement. But we know <clears throat> there is capability on the part of the players. Their interests are moving increasingly in the right direction. Iran, I mentioned, our own, Russia's others. We all want to see something come together for Syria. Could there be a Geneva III? I think it's absolutely essential. It's essential that the parties put their heads together precisely so that the non-radical Syrians can figure out how to compose themselves one with the other and move ahead. A Geneva III can focus on critical problems, uh, <clears throat> problems of a ceasefire, humanitarian relief, and the political future of Syria itself. So I'd like to think that 
the result of a nuclear agreement is really important when you think about Syria in the future. It's the necessary rounding out of where we're headed now as we undertake fresh responsibilities in the Middle East in the containment and destruction of the radical Islamic force of ISIS. Thank you, Frank. Paul? Okay, thank, thank you, Tom. And let me add my thanks uh, to the Wilson Center for hosting this event and to Tom and Bill for their overly generous uh, references to the rest of us. Um, the uh, very high emphasis that we've been giving for several years now to the nuclear issue uh, has tended to overshadow other matters uh, that are of high concern both to Washington and Tehran, including ones where we have some interests that are remarkably parallel. And the places I would look primarily for those interests are the areas closest geographically to Iran. To the east, Afghanistan, which Barney Rubin is going to address in just a moment, and then to the west uh, in Iraq. And for Iran, the, the biggest modern backdrop to Iran's very high concern about internal events in Iraq was the Iran-Iraq War and what happened to them in 1980 and the ensuing eight years in which a war started by Saddam Hussein resulted in enormous human and material cost to the Iranians. And if you ask what does Iran most want in Iraq, it is not to have anything like that happen again and not to have a hostile regime in Baghdad. Now, if you ask uh, in terms of what our preferences might be and the Iranian preferences might be as to the ideal regime in Baghdad, th then we'd probably have some differences. But the Iranians are smart enough also to realize they're not going to get the ideal, whatever that might be. They see the sources of instability in Iraq, which are contrary to their interests. It is not in their interest to have unending unrest and instability along their western border. And I would point to their smartness in this regard uh, to their rather recent um, taking of, of a position basically identical to ours with regard to political change in Baghdad, in which Prime Minister Maliki, who had long been seen sort of as Tehran's man in many ways, was also seen by the Iranians and by us as having become more of the problem than of the solution, and that his increasingly authoritarian and sectarian ways was part of the basis for all of the unrest and violence that we uh, are worried about in the North and West. And so the Iranians, along with us, welcomed the departure of Maliki and welcomed his replacement by Prime Minister Abadi. Um, we now have this group, ISIS, or ISIL, or Islamic State, that has become clearly a top concern here in Washington. It is also a very high concern for Iran, another area of importance where the interests run parallel. Uh, Iran's uh, concern about ISIS and the need to check its advance uh, is reflected in what the Iranians are already doing in Iraq by way of direct material and human support to the Iraqi armed forces to combat this new threat in the North and the West. So there's ample potential here for more uh, coordination and communication between us and the Iranians on a source of very high concern uh, to both of us. Where does the nuclear agreement come into this? Well, I would say in at least a couple of respects, it would facilitate the effort against ISIS and the effort in favor of greater stability in Iraq. Uh, one, by improving the overall U.S.-Iranian relationship, it would cause to recede farther into the past the days we had when we had our troop presence there in the initial, after the initial invasion of Iraq, in which rather than Iraq being an arena of, of uh, cooperation and coordination, it was seen more as a pressure point by the Iranians where they could assist uh, Shia militias and all that stuff we were reading about a few years uh, ago. But secondly, and at least as important, is the communication and coordination uh, factor, uh, both on the political side and on the military side. 
On the political side, is it, it is important uh, that Washington and Tehran send consistent, even if they're not identical, but certainly consistent messages to the politicians in Baghdad and to Sunni Arabs in the Northwest. And we've already implicitly started this with what I referred to with regard to the change of prime ministers. And then on the military and security level, it is important to deconflict whatever we may de be doing in direct confrontation with ISIS. Uh, for all the usual reasons that military officers talk about deconfliction and coordination being so important. And some of that has already implicitly uh, been occurring as well uh, with regard to some of the action in the Northwest in which we've already had airstrikes and we know there are Revolutionary Guard forces effectively <laughs> acting in the same direction against ISIS. But to the extent that we can uh, shed the, uh, the diplomatic inhibitions that we have had all these years until and unless we can get around this nuclear issue, uh, we cannot do that as well as we could. So my concluding thought, although as Tom uh, reiterated earlier, um, quite properly, all the parties have considered completion of the nuclear agreement <laughs> as the immediate top priority. If we do get success by the negotiators by November or whenever, and it comes time to further debate and evaluate that agreement, we have to consider not only what the effect will be on the, the nuclear issue, but how that will change the overall relationship and our way of doing business on these other issues. And I would put the issue of instability in Iraq and our very high concern about ISIS right at the top of the list. Thank you, Paul, very much. And Barney, please. <clears throat> thank you. I'd also like to thank the Wilson Center and uh, Bill in particular for uh, giving me the opportunity to be involved in this project. Um, and I'm also glad that we are able to focus a little bit on Afghanistan now that it has uh, faded from the front pages so much. And I think it's very important to put it in this perspective, in, the pers in perspective of our relations with Iran, because as we draw down our forces, lower our level of uh, financial assistance, the stability of Afghanistan will depend, and I should say the survival of the institutions that we and our Afghan partners have worked to establish, will depend more than before on the ability of the United States and Iran to cooperate, or at least not to blunder into conflicts in Afghanistan. Um, let me go back and review why that is the case. Uh, first, let me set out generally what I understand to be Iran's definition of its national interest in Afghanistan. First, Iran wants stability in Afghanistan in order to address uh, threats that it has suffered from, such as narcotics trafficking, uh, large flows of refugees. I don't mean to stigmatize refugees as being threats, but it, it, po it, it poses social problems for Iran. And of course, uh, terrorism, and specifically extremist Sunni terrorism. Now, I said Iran wants stability but there, in Afghanistan, but there are two caveats to that. That is, it does not want Afghanistan to be stabilized by Sunni extremists, or as the Iranians refer to them, perhaps not always accurately, Salafis. And, th and, and it does not want Afghanistan's stability to come at the cost of a permanent U.S. military presence on their border. Uh, and of course, the worse U.S.-Iran bilateral relations are, and the more we are still talking about everything being on the table, the more salient that consideration becomes in their policy. At the start, after 2001, at the start of uh, the current regime in Afghanistan, I think it is fairly well known uh, that there was strong U.S.-Iranian diplomatic uh, cooperation at the Bonn Conference. In fact, the current foreign minister of Iran and the recently departed special representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan in the State Department, Javad Zarif and Jim Dobbins, worked together very closely at the Bonn Conference, which I observed personally as I was a member of the UN team there. 
Uh, what's not as well known is that the Iranian Revolutionary Guards worked closely on the ground with uh, the CIA and U.S. Special Forces because otherwise we would have had no way uh, of establishing a presence there uh, since the country we were habituated to work through, Pakistan, did, uh, was in fact supporting the other side and did not have the contacts that we would have needed to strengthen the groups to overthrow the Taliban. It was really through, and it was really through that U.S.-Iran cooperation that we were able to get the, the basic political pact in the Bonn Conference that led to the Constitution and that underlies the current uh, arrangement in Afghanistan. Um, once that pact was in place through the Constitution, operational political cooperation between U.S. and Iran became less important because there were rules to which we had both agreed. Uh, Iran became uh, important more for uh, the regional aspects of Afghan policy, and it's a member of uh, the uh, Istanbul process or heart of Asia process. Uh, it's a member of the Regional Economic Cooperation Conference on Afghanistan. Um, and uh, also of some informal gatherings, which also provided settings where the U.S. and Iran could engage in multilateral settings. Um, but our bilateral regional engagement was more with Pakistan because we were trying to address the problem of the Pakistan-based insurgency led by the Taliban. And whether we were trying to wipe out its safe havens or find a political settlement with it, we still, the road led through Pakistan. Now, um, what has happened now uh, is that as we have withdrawn uh, and a crisis has developed within the current electoral process, in the past 13 years, every national election in Afghanistan was about renegotiation of the basic pact uh, at Bonn that uh, came about partly through U.S.-Iran cooperation. This time, it was even more intensely about that. And the fact that this election is not going to be resolved solely on the basis of the agreed rules and institutions, but that if it is resolved, it will be resolved by an informal political agreement, at least an extra-legal, not illegal, but extra-constitutional political agreement, means that to some extent we have returned to the situation earlier where operational cooperation, on p political cooperation between the U.S. and Iran may become, in fact, already is much more necessary, and we are suffering from that right now. Uh, to be concrete, as you all know, there was a moment, at least one moment, perhaps several, when uh, supporters of Dr. Abdullah, who believed he had won the election, uh, we're talking about using their support within the security agencies to actually take control of the government in Kabul extra-constitutionally. The United States intervened, as has been reported in the media, to explain that if there were such extra-constitutional action, the Afghan government would lose the support that it was receiving from the United States. It's very important in that, under those circumstances for those who might be thinking about taking such action to learn to know that they won't get support from any other source. And the source they would be most likely to go to, in this case, would be Iran. So coordination of the United States and Iran against such extra-constitutional acts is very important for the stability of this difficult transition. It's made more difficult by the, the suspicions that have grown in the, not only from real differences of interest, but in, from the lack of cooperation. Some Iranians suspect the United States rigged the second round of elections in Afghanistan. Of course, there remains the issue of a long-term U.S. military presence, even though President Obama has said that it, there will be a small presence just for two years after 2014. Nonetheless, without direct communications, Iranians are not inclined to take that at face value. Um, so it means that it will be very difficult uh, whether there is an agreement between the two candidates, which uh, it will be very if there is such an agreement, it will be very difficult to implement it and keep it working without U.S.-Iran cooperation. If there isn't an agreement, and instead there is, uh, and I, I don't believe this is likely, but you know there's some speculation about it. There's some interim arrangement. It will be even more important 
Um, and that will be necessary. It doesn't obviate the need to seek some kind of either settlement or, and or destruction of the Taliban safe haven in Pakistan. But a condition for that is maintaining the coherence of the political coalition on which the uh, current government is built. And for that, U.S.-Iran cooperation is essential. From the U.S. point of view, the lack of a nuclear agreement is not such an obstacle to that cooperation there as it is in the Middle East, because in the Middle East, of course, we have major uh, security partners uh, and uh, other countries with whom we need to have good relations who uh, absolutely don't want Iran involved in that area at all, especially if, it, if there was no nuclear agreement. There is no such constraint with respect to Afghanistan. The constraint is more on the Iranian side that their leadership has not authorized the political side to engage with us on the issue as long as the level of bilateral uh, tension and hostility largely symbolized by the nuclear issue remain where they are now. So that again, uh, a, re a nuclear agreement would open the way uh, for a diplomatic pr and political process that would make it possible, not far from certain, to retain uh, some of the important gains that we have made in Afghanistan over the last 13 years. Thank you, Barney, very much. And we'll proceed right away to your questions. I believe there are microphones available. If you'll raise your hand, I will certainly choose you to make a question. If you would be kind enough to give us your name and any affiliation, we would be grateful for that. There would be a prize for the shortest question and for the longest question. And I borrow an old Soviet joke from Radio Armenia. First prize is two days in Moscow. Second prize is, a uh, last prize is four weeks in Moscow. Thank you very much. <laughs> right here, sir. <laughs> uh, Yusuf Babunli, USN. Uh, thank you for the interesting panel. Uh, I'm actually surprised uh, not to hear about Azerbaijan. It's, it's the country to the north of Iran. Uh, ethnic Azeris constitute one-third of the population of Iran. Uh, this is the only country in the world that borders both Russia and Iran, but is still pro-Western. And in fact, uh, Ambassador Pickering mentioned the energy politics. It's the only country in the region that uh, transports uh, oil through Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan uh, to the Mediterranean, and 40% uh, of Israel's oil comes from that country. And it's getting ready to launch another uh, southern gas corridor to supply uh, uh, European states uh, with gas. So the question is, uh, where do you think Azerbaijan fits in this equation uh, as far as U.S. policy uh, towards Iran is concerned, and the entire region, the Caucasus region? Thank you. I think it's a very important question. And my sense is that in your explanation of the importance of Azerbaijan, uh, you made very clear the answer, at least to a fundamental piece, and we addressed it in the energy equation. How can, in fact, energy of the region uh, become useful in a political sense, as I said earlier, in providing for more energy independence on the part of the Europeans? And in that sense, Azerbaijan plays an important role. Um, I'm acutely vis uh, con uh, conscious of, from at least one extensive visit to, Tehran, to, to Iran, of the presence of a large minority of Azeri speakers uh, in the country. And it is, it is, in that sense, also a, a very interesting point that Iran does have significant minorities and, is in, as a result, obviously has to look after those minorities in terms of where the questions uh, that it deals with internally are, are going. I'd like to call upon my friends if they have anything else to say. We did not pick every neighbor. Uh, and for that, we apologize to those <coughs> with strong attachments uh, to Azerbaijan, to Armenia, uh, to you know, Turkmenistan. Uh, uh, I think that probably will cover it. Uh, what? Pakistan. Well, Pakistan is not a neighbor, but it's a near neighbor. It, yeah, it is. But we, it's a neighbor. It's a neighbor. It is a neighbor. You're right. Of course, we we did. Yeah, uh, and so so we didn't take everybody, uh, and for that, I guess we owe you an apology. Okay, next question. Please back here on the, on the far corner. Good afternoon. My name is Jocelyn Duvall. I'm with the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. I have a question for you, Mr. Pillar. Uh, you mentioned how the United States and Iran have a, uh, a vested interest in working together, a security concern in Iraq. 
A couple of days ago, I read in the Washington Post that uh, Iran had come out and ousted the fact that the United States had approached it to uh, perhaps um, through back channels to uh, work with them uh, against ISIS in Iraq. And then the uh, Iranian government came out and sort of said, look what the U.S. approached us, we would never work with you, etc. Uh, how would you explain that, sir? The United States and Iran have such a, an interest in working together. Uh, it's explainable because both we and Iran have our hardline elements that are um, very resistant, not only to this particular nuclear deal, but to any improvement of relations at all. And this really gets into another dimension of what uh, a nuclear deal would do that I didn't uh, mention besides a couple of reasons that I uh, did voice uh, simply in the interest of time, and that is what effect uh, there would be or at least might be, uh, on internal politics in Iran and on the, shall we say, the distribution of portfolios with regard to Iranian foreign policy. Um, the kind of resistance that you are seeing is centered in, insofar as it's inside the regime, in parts of the regime that are not the ones we are dealing with primarily on the nuclear issue. We are dealing with the foreign ministry, with the president, with Mr. Rouhani, with uh, Foreign Minister Zarif. And they are not the ones uh, who have the, the portfolio in terms of uh, what's going on in the gr on the ground in Anbar province or elsewhere in confronting ISIS. This is mainly other elements of the regime, and in particular the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, we're not going to change uh, the <laughs> attitudes of those uh, elements of the regime overnight, but the internal politics and distribution of portfolios will be in my judgment, substantially affected by the failure or the success of the nuclear negotiations. Uh, Rouhani and Zarif have placed enormous, uh, basically placed an enormous bet on the success of this endeavor. Um, and implicitly, the Supreme Leader has, insofar as he has uh, given them latitude to go as far as they have over this past year and make the kinds of concessions and con conclude the uh, preliminary deal that they did last fall. To the extent that they get ultimate success, a final deal, and the sanctions relief that would come with it, uh, this would improve their <laughs> political stock, uh, increase their ability to broaden their portfolios and have more of a say on things like cooperation in Iraq. Insofar as uh, the negotiations fail, it will be in the other direction. Um, and there really wouldn't be, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the familiar faces we've been dealing with on the nuclear issue that would have any say at all in these concerns. But you're absolutely right that uh, there has been that kind of resistance, uh, which I would underscore mirrors the sorts of resistance that we have from hardline elements on our side. And in fact, there have been news newspaper reports on both sides in both countries of this equation. Yes. Uh, which have sort of allowed for what I would call a wiggle room in the middle uh, on being able to contact each other, which is, which is interesting to watch. Uh, I'd like a lady's question, if we have one. Right here, please. Marcel. Thank you, Marcel Wahba, uh, independent consultant. I'd like to uh, ask Ambassador Wisner the, on the Syria question. I'm intrigued by the comment you made that uh, Iran will be central to a political negotiation on Syria. I guess what I'd like you to expand on is if we envision a new political settlement in Syria, my guess would be that it will be predominantly Sunni. Uh, an, a government in Syria, a new government, is likely to be predominantly Sunni. And so how would Iran uh, be willing to play with that government, and what would happen to the relationship of a new government in Syria with Hezbollah and Iran, that whole triangle? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Those are obviously important and uh, very difficult questions, and in the absence of a, uh, an engage a political engagement in Syria, it's hard to predict exactly how it would come out, but let me give you some general considerations, and ones I believe reflect Iranian dispositions. I said in my opening remarks that Iran looks to protect its essential national interests, uh, its access to Syria, its access through Syria to other Shia communities, notably southern Lebanon, uh, her sense of being able to defend her uh, herself in what has been a long-standing confrontation with the State of Israel, and inside Syria itself, cultural, 
ties that go back, regime ties that are now of long-standing nature. But at the same time, what is proved to be very much the case uh, that in my own uh, reflections with the Iranians is the degree to which they feel themselves overstretched. Uh, they are carrying huge obligations domestically. They're carrying obligations <clears throat> uh, in towards Afghanistan, but the Syrian burden is particularly heavy, economically, militarily, politically, and at the same time, this is masked in a in what has been an outright confrontation with the Saudis. Uh, to add now Iraq to the equation, you can begin to get a sense of why Iran would like to see some space, not give up essential interests, but to be able to increase its capacity to maneuver. Does Iran want, at the end of the day, a continuation of the present regime? Um, I'm sure if the Iranians answered that question, they'd do it with a bromide, and that is, let the Syrian people decide. But I think under the surface is uh, they're looking for an arrangement that's going to provide stability in which Iran can play and not be excluded. You point to the possibility of a Sunni-dominated Iran. Syria is a very complicated place, Marcel, as you know better than I. The majority of soldiers that fight in Assad's army are Sunni, uh, as are many of his supporters and even those who seek a political outcome that are, is neither neither the Ba'ath regime nor its opponents, be they radical or free Syrian. Uh, Iraq's a complicated country. I would imagine some form of settlement flowing from Syria will only occur if there is an agreement between the major powers. We, we can't, the parties, be they free Syrian or, <coughs> or the Ba'ath, uh, will not come to the table if there isn't a, a real sense of buy-in by the United States, Russia, Iran, and Saudi Arabia and Turkey. I think that's essential. Uh, if there is such a buy-in and the parties come to the table, it's going to be really complex getting an agreement. We've seen it already. But is an agreement possible? Are Syrians ready for an agreement? Can you imagine a ceasefire uh, turning into the local, from the local ceasefires you're seeing in Syria today to something beyond. Humanitarian effort, I can easily imagine the Iranians have been part of humanitarian efforts. And then a political outcome that preserves the unity of Syria, doesn't fragment the country, I think is something I can imagine and I think the Iranians can imagine too. So as I put all these pieces together, I come up with some common strands between the way we see Syria and a possible way out of this nightmare civil war on which, Daesh, which ISIS feeds. Um, and we have common perspectives with the Iranians. Another question? Yes, up in here, please, this gentleman. Yes, please. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Alex Leibowitz. Uh, you've commented a lot about the possibilities of cooperation between the uh, prospective cooperation between the U.S. and Iran. One reads a lot, however, that if uh, there's too much of that, the Sunnis would react very negatively both in Iraq and Syria and elsewhere in the region and that this would make it really much more difficult to solve the ISIS problem or, you know, other problems sort of like that. I'm wondering whether you think this is an accurate assessment, and if so, how do we deal with that? Thank you. I, others will want to jump in. I would say primarily the ISIS problem is an issue for Sunnis, and it's an issue that is created by Sunni extremism. And so I don't see a natural proclivity here, despite the fact that uh, the Shia government of Iraq and, and, and Iran are deeply involved for their own reasons in this particular issue. Uh, so I don't see that the prevailing divider in the region is totally a Sunni-Shia divide. I've always been of that persuasion. I think there are 
Arab-Persian differences that in some ways run with and run against this. There are economic uh, differences that run with and against it. And to look at the Middle East is purely subject to all questions being looked at through the perspective of uh, Sunni glasses or Shia glasses is, I think, an oversimplification. But my colleagues with experience in the region might want to uh, raise that. Uh, Barney. Well, uh, first, just there is no such concern in Afghanistan. There's no group in Afghanistan that doesn't want U.S.-Iran cooperation there. With respect to the areas to the west of Iran, uh, for that very reason you cite, I didn't say uh, it's, it would be a mistake to, to frame cooperation with Iran uh, as uh, an alternative to cooperation with the other countries in the region. And they do have a, a, a fear, uh, an unfounded fear, I believe, but they have a fear um, that uh, at, so, at some point if the U.S. and Iran resolve enough of their bilateral differences then we will turn to Iran rather than to Saudi Arabia or Egypt, Israel being a separate category. Um, we don't want that. We can't, well, that's not possible. So what would be uh, important, though, is if there were a breakthrough uh, in the nuclear negotiations, is that we could work with our partners in the Arab world um, to find a way uh, to acknowledge the reality of Iran's involvement and involve it in a diplomatic process without in any way making it into a privileged partner for cooperation. We're talking about U.S.-Iran cooperation because the nuclear deal may open the way to that, um, but that is not a substitute for trying to cooperate with the other powers in the region as well. I think it's also clear we pushed the Maliki government. I don't think the Iranians pushed against the Maliki government on opening the door to greater Sunni participation right. in Iraqi governance in the future. Other comments on this one, Paul? Yeah, well, we're always going to face the challenge of the tendency to zero some things in sectarian terms that actors in the region exhibit. Um, but they can be overcome with, as the example that Tom just cited uh, is, uh, demonstrates. And also, I would say we have to distinguish between what some of the players, and specifically the Sunni Gulf Arabs in this case, uh, say to us, which can be, as we used to say in the intelligence business, said more to influence than to inform, um, and does not necessarily reflect their, their true, true views. Uh, you know, they're trying to game us, but uh, if our relationship with Iran changed, uh, that would be one of the biggest factors in their own thinking about their own relationships with Iran because our relationship with them is so important. And we are already seeing some anticipation of this with some of the thawing and uh, demarching between uh, the Gulf Arab states uh, and Iran. We've had a number of visits. Um, and they've had a history in the past also of their own rapprochements. Um, and, and finally, I would just say, again, I would try to bring back uh, the question of the issue of what difference, if any, would a nuclear agreement make? And I think Barney already hinted at this in his last comment. Uh, to the extent that Iran gets reintegrated into the world and the regional community of nations as a more or less normal player, this tends to dilute this uh, sectarian zero-summing business. Hala, you wanted to join this? It's a race to see who gets here first with the microphone. <laughs> and there will be no last prize. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just want to pick up on what Paul said uh, regarding Iran's relation with the Persian Gulf states. And the, um, the Arab countries have expressed their concern about a nuclear Iran. But they also have expressed their concern about a deal. You know, so hypothetical case, if there is going to be a deal, what is the reaction of these countries going to be to see Iran as a partner sitting in all these negotiations across the table from them? I mean, Iran, we know, was not invited to Geneva too. Mm -hmm. It was invited as an observer, and they said, no, thank you. No. They want to be a player. 
So I mean, can you elaborate a little bit on that part of, you know, the Gulf? Well, I already said a piece. Frank, do you want to jump in on this? Yeah, first? Let, I can take a shot at it, Paul. Fill, fill it out. I, <coughs> I think, Hala, that while well, you make an important point, I think I would measure it with a degree of responsibility we as Americans share. Um, if we are to move forward in our own diplomacy with Iran, um, we're going to have to make it very clear to our Gulf friends and allies that we are talking to them, that they, we take no actions that leave them surprised. Second, <clears throat> that we have no intention of diminishing our own security structures in the Gulf that give them essential protection that between a set of political security ties, we intend to stand by them and therefore provide them additional assurance from which they can reach out and begin their own accommodation from a position of strength with the Iranian side. So I think we will be partners and players. But I want to come back to remarks my colleagues have said. It, history is long, um, and it's replete with uh, confrontations between Sunni and Shia and in recent years uh, the Ira Iranians have found it in their cycle in their ideological and in their national interest to reach out to Sunni community to Shia communities but I have a sense that national interest of Iran is increasingly asserting itself and that national in interest is demonstrated in respect for the neighborhood you live in, to live and to let live. Why would you find Iran today looking at Iraq and welcoming <clears throat> the continuation of the territorial integrity of Iraq towards a more balanced government, but one that offers assurances to the Kurds and assurances to the Sunni, because that's the way it has always been. Iran lives better, more securely, if all the players find some place in the equilibrium. And so I think we may be watching, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, Iran reemerging as a status quo power, and one, therefore, that gives us, in the longer run, uh, the ability to move in classic terms of balance of power. If I could just to pick the baton back up from Frank on that, this is a whole area where there has been a lot of evolution in the 35 years of the Islamic Republic. And in the initial years after the revolution, it was a lot different from that. Um, there was this almost uh, you know, Trotskyite sense of a permanent revolution and, and the idea that if they didn't have like-minded revolutions in the neighborhood, including on the other side of the Gulf, theirs, their own wouldn't survive. Well, it survived now for 35 years. And just like the Bolsheviks, they realized, uh, hey, I guess we're not going to go away. And, and I couldn't agree more with Frank that uh, you know, they see themselves as, and would like to see themselves even more after this nuclear deal, as a normal, non-pariah, status quo, uh, fully accepted member of the community. And of course, they, with their big uh, Persian Empire tradition and everything, see themselves as one of the more important players in that community. Uh, but they won't, don't consider it any more necessary to, you know, uh, subvert the government of Bahrain, even though we've got unsettled issues uh, with something like that. We couldn't have said that in the early years of the Islamic Republic. I think we can say it now. I just, one final point. I think that there is a deep concern still not laid to rest in Riyadh and elsewhere in the Gulf that suddenly... Uh, we have become like the man who wishes to change his bride, and it's 100%. And that there is a wedding ready in Tehran, and that suddenly the whole political, geopolitical relationship in the region is going to be changed. Nothing could be further from the truth but the hard prob problem is to demonstrate that, and we have been hard at work in doing it, and that's a fundamental recommendation in our report. That is, interestingly enough, totally, um, put it this way, punctuated by the notion that among Muslim countries there is no permanent enmity, 
and that from time to time they will reach out despite their deep differences. And we saw it under Khatami. And we now see that uh, the foreign minister of Iran is invited to Riyadh, and I hope you will go. I hope we will go at a time when real progress can be made. So that on that level, there are opportunities and openings. Uh, and Frank and Paul have talked about what would only, could only be called the maturing of the revolution and the notion that you don't change geography and neighbors, that you have to live in the region and each side is moving. It would be a tragedy, I think, if the Rouhani government, which has had a lot to do with what I would call a better sense of balance, were to disappear. And I think, obviously, without making too fine a point, the nuclear agreement, which they have promised because they believe it will relieve the economic pressure they're under, were not to succeed for one reason or another. That would change the equation again, unfortunately, and it's not a, yet a permanent condition. Uh, but our report points to the opportunities that are out there and, and the possible positive role we could play. But it's hugely challenging, and therefore it's enormously significant for the region and for us. I'll take a few more questions. Yes, back here, please. Uh, Amal Mudalali, I'm with the Wilson Center. I have a quick question about, oh, Mr. Wisner is leaving. My question is for him. <laughs> <laughs> you can walk with him to the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> and you have the right to ask a question before you move to the elevator if you wish. <laughs> Otherwise, you can turn yeah, the. I'll, I'll, I can ask for the second, for the. Okay, the you gentlemen. ask your second question. Uh, if there is no, an agree no agreement, nuclear, yes. nuclear agreement, how do you think this will affect uh, the uh, Syrian uh, situation and uh, Lebanon, especially South Lebanon, where Iran has Hezbollah and has the possible confrontation uh, with Israel. Thank you. Paul, do you want to pick that up? It will simply uh, reduce the chance of any improvement in an already bad situation w in which the good solutions are hard to find. Um, you know, it's not going to have a a direct immediate effect in the sense of <coughs> we come to November and the story and the headlines is negotiations collapse, and that has some material effect on the ground. Sir, I don't think that's going to happen. It's more of an opportunity cost and not having the opportunity to uh, um, bring in the Iranians in a, in a way that, as Frank uh, earlier described, they would have to be bring, brought in if uh, all the relevant players in Syria are going to be involved in a way that at least gives us a chance to have more of a solution. I think that, there, you know, there's an interconnectedness in the problems in the region. And in many ways, it's very important. On the other hand, the solution of any one problem is not going to resolve all problems, but it can help in creating some kind of a shift in direction. Uh, and we have, I think, as a result of the rapid changes in the region over the last year, been presented with problems more rapidly than we can think about solutions to the former ones. And so it really is important, I think, to see whether there are, if not game-changing, put it this way, trend-changing possibilities uh, in moving ahead. And the nuclear agreement offers us that kind of a possibility uh, because it can affect the region in a way that will open the doors to new pieces of opportunity, if I can put it that way. Right. I'll take a couple more questions. Uh, yes, sir, right here. It's the second gentleman in. Thank you very much, Benjamin Tua. It's been reported uh, that the Iranians have shot down a drone uh, that they accuse Israel of sending to spy over an Iranian nuclear-related facility. Uh, could you uh, comment on uh, that report or reports and uh, its, uh, their implications? Thank you. Gee, Paul, that looks like yours. <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely no information to add to the uh, press report. I was just my, my own reaction was one when, when that uh, uh, report came out was one of lack of surprise. Um, uh, I would expect the Israelis to use all their technical and human means to uh, find out everything they can about Iran, including perhaps using that technique. Uh, and I don't think the Iranians were surprised. Um, 
And we shouldn't be surprised by the Iranian efforts or, and even success of doing something like that. Of course, we had the earlier uh, incident with you know, our own drone, which was a somewhat different thing. But um, So I, I didn't see that as a change one way or the other, and it, it shouldn't have affected attitudes in Tehran or in Jerusalem or any place else. Right, so let me just add that it was, yeah, an, you want a it, was drone an, on, just, it was an unarmed drone. It was an unarmed drone. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was uh, intelligence gathering. Before I take the next question, I just want to uh, note that Jane's been able to join us. Thank you, Jane, very much. Thank you for being with us here today, uh, both the Wilson Center and personally dropping in on us now. And we're having, I think, um, an interesting conversation, uh, and it'll run over a little bit. but. I will take two or three more questions maybe together, and then we'll try to answer those as the wind-up, if I may. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Fadi Boris Fatemi, Oxfordshire Group. Uh, thank you for the panel's excellent uh, presentation. My question is to Professor Rubin. Um, you very correctly pointed out uh, Iran's role in helping us uh, to defeat the Taliban, and as a reward, they were called as part of the axis of evil. And I think when you talk to the diplomats, they have never forgotten that. Why would they trust us now to help with Afghanistan if, in fact, they do help with Afghanistan? Barney, hold Thank that you. question. I'm going to take two more. May I have one from this side of the room, please? Thank you. Uh, Judith Kipper, I'd like to ask you, Paul, if we look back at the Arab reports of some years ago uh, that the UN did by Arabs for Arabs, uh, I don't think the Arab Spring or the emergence of ISIS and other groups is much of a surprise. Over the long term, looking at American interests, the lack of our capacity to defeat them militarily and our uh, increasingly limited influence, how do you really uh, assess this threat, which you said earlier in your remarks, it's a big threat, we all know that. Uh, where do we go with this kind of a threat? It's a very new situation, it seems to me. Thanks, Judith, an extremely penetrating question. I'll take one in the back here, perhaps the gentleman closest to the center with his hand highest. Hi, thank you, uh, Hanif Kashani, Brookings Institution. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Rubin if he could discuss the importance of uh, the nuclear deal, nuclear deal, I'm sorry, uh, in regards to its connection with Afghanistan and uh, Iran's Chabah Chabahar port. Thank you. Good. One more? Yes, sir. Can I? Uh, Robert Kopek, an independent energy consultant. Uh, the role of uh, Turkey as a connective uh, power was mentioned. Uh, it's my understanding that ISIS is using uh, its oil uh, that it is producing uh, to is being sold to Turkish companies in the black market, and uh, without that financing, they would be a lot uh, less able to carry on what they're doing. Good. What I would think be the reaction of good. The Barney, point? you got two questions, and Paul, you've got two questions. So I may have a comment at the end. Okay. Right. First. Um, on the axis of evil, of course, the Iranian diplomats who are involved in the nuclear negotiations uh, mention this quite frequently, and whenever there is uh, a, a setback or, uh, for instance, someone in the audience here mentioned a statement recently by uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei against cooperating with the United States in Iraq. When the Iranians see an argument in the United States by a prominent person against the nuclear agreement, then they say, oh, we're back to the axis of evil again. Yeah. But just as we should understand that Iran has gone through a political evolution, there's a new president, um, and uh, we should explore the op opportunities that that gives us without being uh, overly trustful or naive, uh, two characteristics I have rarely observed in the U.S. government during my experience there. Um, so they, sh they also understand that we had an election, we had an experience, uh, and that uh, we are now calculating our interests in a different way. This trust has to be built, but uh, there's a basis on, to build it through these negotiations. Um, with respect to Afghanistan, uh, you mentioned Char Bahar. Um, 
the Charbahar is a port, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, an Iranian port on the Persian Gulf. And there is a joint uh, I Indian Iranian project uh, to connect Afghanistan by land, at, by railroad and road, to the port of Charbahar, which is extremely uh, important for Afghanistan, uh, as well as for Iran and India, because it will provide Afghanistan with an outlet to uh, the sea, to maritime trade, uh, that does not go th through Pakistan. Um, one of the uh, advantages of having some limited cooperation with Iran at the beginning of the uh, Afghan experience was that it provided us with greater margin of maneuver and leverage with respect to Pakistan. In a way, am I suggesting trying to isolate or exclude Pakistan? But uh, we, we had more freedom of operation. Similarly, to the extent that Afghanistan can develop this alternative route, um, the United States, India, and others will be able to have more be better able to have access to Afghanistan and develop it economically um, through uh, through that route as well. Now, I, I had a personal experience with this because then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was visiting Iran, and uh, there he signed some agreement. Uh, I don't remember exactly what about Char Bahar, and the State Department spokesman was asked about it and uh, said that it was consistent with the U.S. policy of supporting the new Silk Road to promote economic connectivity for Afghanistan. I got an excited email from an Iranian official, I was not in the government at the time, saying, what does this mean? Of course, they clarified that the sanctions were still in place, but, uh, <laughs> and we were not going to support it. But if there were a nuclear uh, agreement and the sanctions were lifted, then the United States could support Afghanistan and India's effort to develop its greater connectivity through Iran, and that would be of mutual benefit to all of us. Paul? On Judith Kipper's uh, comments, I certainly agree with you, Judith, that if we look back at things like the trends uh, covered in the Arab Development uh, Reports, that we shouldn't be surprised by uh, new extremist groups, including ones that really get our attention like ISIS has. Uh, I've written on this uh, larger subject about the overall way to assess this threat elsewhere, and I don't want to just repeat what I've said elsewhere, um, uh, other than to note that uh, to some extent, in my judgment, I know I would have a lot of disagreement from my colleagues on this, but in my judgment, uh, much of our reaction to the ISIS phenomenon says more about ourselves than our reaction to 9-11 and so on. Uh, but I hasten to add that everything I said uh, earlier uh, in the hour uh, about Insofar as ISIS is a major policy concern, and it has become uh, that, as declared by our president, um, we ought to go about confronting it the right way. And to use all of the uh, uh, arrows uh, uh, in, in our, in our uh, quiver, um, and that's where the Iranian role comes into play in such a big way in both Syria, as Frank discussed, and, and in Iraq. Um, I think the political side of this is at least as important as the military. Um, the dramatic gains that ISIS scored in, in Western Iraq, that when they really got our attention, even before they started, uh, you know, the killings of the, the captives, um, is, is a reflection of the sectarian uh, politics and the authoritarian ways of Maliki and everything that we've read about, a, as indicated by the fact that many of those gains came at the hands of not ISIS fighters themselves, but other Iraqi Sunni Arabs that were more disillusioned with the government of Baghdad than they were with these fanatics who had, uh, who had come across the Syrian border. Um, and all of this is food for discussion with the Iranians, uh, to bring it back to our earlier topic. And finally, the question about the uh, the illicit sales of oil. This clearly has gotten a lot of attention of our policymakers, and I think it needs to be and probably is and will be attacked on two different fronts, the supply side and the demand side, um, loosely uh, defined. Uh, and on the demand side, it, it means working mainly with the government of Turkey uh, to try to do something more about, uh, you know, interdicting um, uh, the trade uh, in this, which is consists of mostly individual tanker trucks, you know, going over the border. Um, how much we can, how much of that cooperation we can get, I don't know, but I have no doubt that uh, our officials are working very hard on it. The other big question, uh, which remains to be seen to the extent that we expand any military operations in Iraq, is whether we will actually hit physically with airstrikes, mm -hmm. you know, some of the uh, oil facilities that are currently in territory that ISIS controls. I would not rule that out. I have just, uh two or three things to do. 
First, to thank uh, Paul and uh, Barney and to Frank in his absence for their being here and for their uh, excellent answers to your questions. Secondly, to thank all of you for coming. It's been a pleasure and honor to have you. I think the debate and the questions were particularly good, uh, and we're appreciative of that. And then finally, because Bill Lewers had the first word, Bill, is there a last word you want to have? Our website is theiranproject.org. <laughs> our, Lance, our website is theiranproject.org. We have copies of the report for you as you go out. We have a limited number of copies. Please don't stock up for your library or your organization. <laughs> One to a customer and then everybody, I think, will have an opportunity to see it. And if by chance you don't get the report, our website is theironproject.org and the report's there. Bill. Oh, everybody's half out of the room. Stephen, do you want to say anything? No, I'm sorry. Sorry, Steve, my apologies. Okay, thank you again for being with us.